Hi everyone, Professor Rosenthal here, and today we're going to take a look at a section titled Related Rates. And as you can see on the pictures on the screen right now, in Related Rates section, you're going to find things that are moving. It could be a plane that is going in a certain direction, two planes are converging towards each other, a ladder sliding or a container full of liquid is emptying so things are changing over time and as the name suggests you will be given one rate of change in the given situation and will be asked to find another rate of change so for example in a container that is draining of liquid you might be asked uh, they might give you the rate, rate at which the volume is changing and they might ask you the rate at which the height of the water in the container is changing or in the case of planes, you may know the rate of change this distance is changing versus the rate of change this distance is approaching, uh, this plane is approaching to the intersection and you may be asked to find at what rate is the direct distance between them closing or changing. Now these questions, um, to be perfectly honest, tend to be a little bit on the more challenging side. So don't be discouraged if in the beginning you have a little bit hard time in this section um, with practice. I know you're going to do better. And also just to give you a heads up of what's coming up, like the next section is not going to be nearly as challenging, so just try to get through this, go to the next one, and perhaps at one point, you know, you might even uh, study this section a little bit, go to the next one, and study that one, and come back to a little bit more in related race, because this one is going to take a little bit more of your time and effort, but it is worth it because you're learning problem-solving skills, which are essential. All right, so we're going to begin with the easier kinds of problems. And I'll leave it on the uh, screen there for a minute for you to take a look at the objectives. So first of all, some general things we should know about this section. Things are changing as time goes by, as I mentioned. So for instance, if we mention the rate of change of height, then make sure that you write that as a derivative as dh dt if you're representing height by the letter h and time uh, in seconds let's say or minutes with the letter t so the rate of change of height as a derivative can be written as dh dt that's the derivative of height with respect to time okay what if we have something like derivative of change excuse me the rate of change of area that's dA dt if your area is represented by the letter A. Similarly, you get the idea. I think the rate of change of volume would be represented by dV dt. The rate of change of an angle. Yes, we are going to deal with trig functions as well. And at times, we may need to find the rate of change of an angle. And if your angle is theta, that would be d theta dt. Notice in all of these examples over here that the top letter is changing, the quantity, but the denominator doesn't change, right? So basically you always have dt in the denominator. That's because the derivative is always going to be taken with respect to the time variable because you're trying to see what happens as time goes by. So remember that in this section all the derivatives are with respect to t. And there is a strategy um, to solve the related rate problems and I'm going to go through the strategy as we go through the examples. Uh, again, I'm going to leave that here for a few moments for you to take a look at. Okay, I'll come back to this as we're doing some of the questions, but for now I'm going to begin with the easier kinds of problems. And the easier kind of problems are um, the ones you don't even have a word problem attached to it. Sometimes I call them preview problems, okay? Because if you know how to, how to um, get your equation in a given situation, from that point forward, you're going to have to do these steps. So here for our preview problems, the only thing you're being asked is, if given this equation, can you differentiate it with respect to t or the time variable? And here I want you to assume that x is a function of time, y is a function of time, and z is a function of time, meaning that they all change with time. In that situation, could you differentiate both sides with respect to the t variable? So on the left side, you're going to have 2x times dx dt plus 2y times dy dt equals 2z times dz dt. You might say, okay, where is it these dz dt, dy dt's come from? Because remember, we're assuming z or y or x for that matter are or functions of time. So almost think about like the chain rule kicking in because you are differentiating both sides with respect to the time variable. So when you differentiate x squared with respect to t, it becomes 2x times the derivative of the inside 
which is dx dt. This is somewhat similar to the implicit differentiation section we covered recently. There we were doing this with the y variable, right, because we were differentiating everything with respect to x, and when we see a y term such as y squared, we would say 2y dy dx, because y is a function of x, so the same idea, but now everything is a function of time. All right, let's take a look at this one right here. Area equals 1 half x times y. We need to differentiate with respect to t. And because x is a function of time and y is a function of time, we are going to apply the product rule here. And I'm going to keep the um, 1 half right outside. Find the product rule. It'll be 1 half times. So typically product rule, you write the first one times the derivative of the second. So x times dy dt plus second times the derivative of the first, y times dx dt. At the moment, we're just leaving them like that, but in the actual problems, you are going to be given some values, um, so such as x may be given, y may be given, you know, some of these things will be given. One of them will be the unknown, and we can actually solve for that unknown. And in this last example, I also divided both sides by 2. You were not asked to do anything else for now, but when you're plugging the numbers in, it's, it'll be nice to have a simpler version of your equation. All right, how do we handle trig functions? So once again, we are differentiating with respect to t, both sides, that's the question. So the derivative of sine theta will be differentiate the outside function, cosine theta, times derivative of the inside, again, assuming everything is changing with time, so that'll be times d theta dt, equals, all right, on the right-hand side, 5 over x. We can rewrite that as 5 times x to the negative 1. Okay, so in that situation, to take the derivative, bring the negative 1 down, so you're going to have negative 5 times x to the negative 2, and don't forget times the derivative of the inside, it'll be times dx dt. So that'll be negative 5 over x squared, that's what negative 5x to the negative 2 is, right? Negative 5 over x squared times dx dt. A uh, similar example over here, but this time tangent theta equals y over x, and you see here it was a constant over x. Here it's a variable over variable, and both of them are functions of time. So when you differentiate the right-hand side here, you're going to need the quotient rule. Um, so the left-hand side, the derivative of tangent is secant squared theta times d theta dt. And on the right-hand side, use the co quotient rule, where we take the lower times derivative of the higher, that's x times dy dt. Plus, in this case, minus for the quotient rule, there's a minus in the middle, minus higher times derivative to lower, that's y times dx dt, and everything divided by denominator squared. So there we have applied the quotient rule to the right hand side. And over here we have x squared plus 25 equals z squared. Same question, differentiate with respect to the t variable. So the first one uh, will be 2x dx dt. Now, 25 is a constant with respect to time, so that'll become 0, and the right side will become 2z dz dt. Once again, you can divide both sides by 2 to get a simpler version of your equation. Okay, now we have cotangent theta equals x over 5. Let's differentiate both sides with respect to time. This side will become, if you remember, tangent was secant squared, right, the derivative, so cotangent is negative cosecant squared. So it'll be negative cosecant squared times d theta dt. And for the right-hand side, you see here I can rewrite this as 1 over 5 times x. So this is the same as 1 over 5 times x. And 1 over 5 is just a constant, so a constant multiple, I can keep the 1 over 5, differentiate the x, that'll be 1 over 5 times dx dt. And here's another example using the product rule. Here, note that 1 third pi is a constant, so we're just trying to differentiate v equals 1 third pi r square h, and so we have 1 third pi that can be kept outside, and for r square times h, you would need to apply the product rule once again. So dv dt, that's the derivative of the left hand side, equals one-third pi, or pi over three times, the derivative of r squared times h. That's where we're going to use the product rule. So it'll be r squared times dh dt, 
plus h times derivative of r squared, which is 2r dr dt. Okay, now let me show you some of the um, first few types of examples from your assignment. And it's going to look something like this. All right, so suppose you are given an equation, y squared plus x is equal to 0. And they're going to give you some information, such as dy dt is 4, when x is negative 4, and y is 2. What is dx dt? So in questions like this, um, pretty much everything we've learned so far will be very handy. Start by differentiating both sides with respect to the time variable. So in that situation, if you differentiate this equation, you will have 2y dy dt plus 1 times dx dt equals 0. At that point, you can plug in the information. So if dy dt is 4, and x is negative 4, it looks like we're not even going to need the x in this situation, right? But y is 2, plug the 2 in, and um, and then solve for the x dt, that's all we have to do. So 2 times 2 times 4 plus the x dt equals 0, and from there you have 16 plus the x dt is 0, therefore the x dt is negative 16. And it's quite f possible to find a negative number for your rate of change, because you you might have um, like a quantity that is decreasing in size over time, so its rate of change will be negative. All right, so here is another example of the same type. They give you an equation, they give you a bunch of information, they give you one rate of change and asking you for another rate of change. So again, assume that both of these are functions of time, and because they gave us dx dt, they want dy dt. To get dx dt, dy dt out of equa this equation, you need to differentiate both sides with respect to time. So 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt, and the derivative of right hand side will be 0. And now let's start plugging in what's given. dx dt is um, 2. By the way, you could have divided both sides by 2 if you wanted to because 0 over 2 is also 0. You could have gotten rid of those 2's as well. Um, so I didn't do that, but you can certainly do that. So dx dt is 2, x is 4. So here I'm going to put a 2 in. Here I'm going to put a 4. y is 5. And we're trying to find what dy dt, so we're going to solve for dy dt. So again, you could have canceled the 2's right there. But in my case, what I did was, kept them in the beginning. So 2 times 4 times 2 plus 2 times 5 times dy dt equals 0. So here I have 16 plus 10 dy dt equals 0. So subtract the 16 from both sides. And then divide by 10. So you get negative 16 over 10. In your case, you may have gotten negative 8 over 5 because you canceled out the 2's, but ultimately we get the same answer, approximately negative um, 1.6. Or you could also leave it in fractional form as negative 8 over 5. Now for this question, there are no units, but many times in the future problems, there, there will be units associated with that, so make sure you leave the final answer with your units also. Okay, another example, and notice we're starting from the more basic examples, and we're going to work our way towards the more complicated ones, because I really feel like if, if you understand the foundation of how to manipulate these equations, you know, plugging in what's given, solving for what's unknown, if you can do that part of it, that's like half the problem, and then if they throw in a word problem, the other half is extracting information from the word problem to the format of an equation, and you put those two together, there you have solved, um, you know, you mastered the section of uh, related rates. Okay, so here we have a rock thrown into a pond that causes a circular ripple. If the radius of the ripple is increasing at a rate of 3 feet per second, how fast is the circumference changing when the radius is 17 feet? Okay, so this is one of the word problem type of examples, um, but one of the easier ones. So typically here we're dealing with a circle and they're talking about the rate at which the radius of the circle changes and they want to know the rate at which the circumference is changing. And so what we need to do is we need to write an equation that relates the radius with the circumference of a circle. So in this section you might find that 
you know, some, some geometry formulas are going to be needed, Pythagorean theorem might be needed, so you need to start with an equation that relates the variables. In this case, it's the circumference of a circle equation. And the circumference equation is c equals 2 pi r, so that's the circumference of a circle. Let's write it down, c equals 2 pi r. It's good to know the circumference and the area, which is pi r square of a circle. And then what's given to us? Let's see. So the radius is increasing at a rate of 3 feet per second. So based on our earlier work, we know we can represent this as dr dt is 3 feet per second. dr dt is 3. They want to know how fast is the circumference changing. That's dc dt equals what? That's what they want to know at the moment when r is equal to 17 feet. So starting with our defining equation, the equation that relates the variable c equals 2 pi r, we're going to need to define both sides of that equation. We're going to need to take the derivative of both sides with respect to the time variable. So the left side will be dc dt. On the right side you have 2 pi times r. 2 pi is just a constant, so it's just going to be 2 pi times dr dt. And at this point, we can just plug in what's given. So, for example, we know the RDT is 3. And once again, it looks like for this particular example, we didn't even need what R is. But for other problems, you might need that information. So don't discard it right away. Uh, you know, always write it down. And you may or may not need some of the given information. And so here we're going to have 2 pi times 3. So 6 pi. And what about the units? Let's also go ahead and put the units next to it. And you can get a decimal or just leave it as 6 pi. That will be fine. So circumference is a measure of length, right? So it's going to be length, which was in terms of feet per dt is in terms of time, which is in seconds. So it will be feet per second. So the rate at which circumference changes is 18.85 feet per second. All right, we're going to do a few more examples of this type. In your handout, I'm going actually back a page right now. So a few more examples with simple ge geometric uh, formulas from geometry. So for example, say you have a square, and here I'm assuming each side is x. You can pick any letter you like, but as long as it's all of the sides are the same because it's a square. So each side of a square is increasing at a rate of 7 centimeters per second. At what rate is the area of the square increasing? So we need to begin by writing the equation of a circle, excuse me, in this case square, equation of a square, which is a equals x square, area of a square, multiply all uh, x by itself, right, x times x length times width, x square in this case. Okay, then what's given? Each side of a square is increasing at a rate of 7 centimeter per second. That's your dx dt, right? So dx dt is 7. And at what rate is the area changing? That's the, they want to know what is dA dt. At the moment, when the square, the area of the square is 16. So when area equals 16. But if area is equal to 16, and since we know that area is x square, then x is plus or minus the square root of 16, but because it represents the side of a square, it has to be positive, so x is equal to positive 4. So find the ADT when x is 4, that's what's being asked right now. So going back to our defining equation, differentiate both sides with respect to the time variable. So the ADT equals 2x times dx dt, right, because we're assuming everything is a function of time, we're differentiating it with respect to the t variable. At this point, go ahead and plug in the given information. dx dt is 7, x is equal to 4, and from there we can get our dA dt. So dA dt equals 2 times x, which is 4, times dx dt, which is 7. So we're getting 56, and units will be units for area, which is centimeters square per units for time. So it's 56 centimeters square per second. That's the rate at which the area of the square is changing. Okay, so here we have a similar example. Um, this time we have a cube, and all edges of the cube are expanding at a rate of 2 cm per second. How fast is the volume changing when each edge is 5 centimeters? 
So clearly we need to start with the equation that defines the volume of a cube. So V equals x to the third. And let's see what, what is given to us. They said that each edge is expanding at a rate of 2 centimeter per second. So how would you write that as a derivative? dx dt, right? If you assume each side of your cube is represented by x, so that means dx dt is 2. They want to know how fast is the volume changing, so they want to know dv dt, right, as a derivative. And that's going to be done at the moment when each edge is 5, so that means find dv dt when x is equal to 5. Okay, so at this point, again, to get dv dt out of this equation, we need to differentiate both sides with respect to the time variable. So let's do that. So dv dt equals 3x squared dx dt. And at that point, we can start plugging in what's given. So they want to dv, dv dt, so we're going to solve for the left-hand side. dx dt is 2 and x is 5, so 5 squared will be 25. So we'll have 3 times 5 squared times 2, or 3 times 25 is 75 times 2 is 150, and the units for volume is centimeter cube. It'll be 150 centimeter cube per second. All right, so the next question is a little bit different. So now we have a cylindrical tank with a radius of 3 centimeters that is being filled with water at a rate of 2 meter cube per minute. The question is how fast is the height of the water in the container rising? So there is some water in this container and then um, it's being filled in at a rate of 2 meter cube per minute. So we can we can represent H here to be the height of the water in the container and radius is the radius of the water in the container but the shape of the water in the container will be cylindrical it'll fit the shape of the container that it's in and first thing we need to remember is okay they're talking about the rate at which it's being filled in and meter cube notice is a unit of volume right so they are giving us the rate of change of volume here and what is the equation for the volume of a cylinder. Does anybody remember that? Volume equals, if you recall, area of the base times height, right? So that's pi r squared times h. So volume equals pi r squared times h. And they're giving us dv dt, and they want us to figure out how fast is the height of the water increasing. And as a derivative, how would you write that? dh dt, right? So let's review what they gave us. So dv dt is 2 dh dt is what we're trying to figure out. So dv dt is 2. And they said that the radius is equal to 3 meters. The radius of the container is 3 meters. OK, so to, to get out of this equation dh dt, dv dt, we need to differentiate both sides with respect to the time variable. Remembering that pi is just a constant. Now you might think here maybe we're going to have to use the product rule, but let's think about this carefully, okay? So as time goes by, does h, the height of the water in the container, does that change? Yes, because we're pouring in liquid into this container, right? So water is being poured in. So the height is rising, right? h changes. But what about r? Does r change as water is being uh, basically put into this container, does R, the radius of the water in the container, change? Now that doesn't change, right, because the radius is fixed for a cylinder, so as the water is rising, the radius will be fixed as well. And that radius is 3 throughout, so 3 is a constant with respect to time. It does not change as time goes by. So in that situation, um, we can actually put that number 3 in the equation right away at the beginning of the problem because it will not change as time goes by. Now I would advise you not to plug in numbers into your equation 
too early if they are variables. Like look at the previous example. Even though they said at the moment when x is 5, we didn't go ahead and plug in the 5 in here right away because all that would give you is that would stop the time in a sense and it would just tell you what's happening when x is 5 and x is 5 basically the volume is 125 but if you did that early on you're going to lose your equation and there will be nothing to differentiate like how are you going to get the VDT and the XCT right so don't plug your constants in too early unless that variable x is truly a constant meaning it doesn't change over time like here that was not the case but here h changes over time but r radius of the container does not change. So let's go ahead and plug the r in here. So r is 3, 3 squared is 9, so we're going to have 9 pi times h. So that will be our more simplified version of our equation. So here we have v equals 9 pi h. Now let's take a derivative with respect to time of both sides. So dv dt equals 9 pi times dh dt. So at that point, we're going to be ready to plug in our values. So dv dt is what actually was given in this case. It was 2. So the left-hand side is given this time, which is equal to 2. And on the right-hand side, we have 9 pi times the hdt. And the hdt is what they're asking for, right? So we are supposed to find the hdt. And so we're going to need to solve for the HDT. That means divide both sides by 9 pi. So the HDT equals 2 divided by 9 pi. Now, if you're trying to get this as a decimal in your calculator, uh, please put a parenthesis after the division sign because you don't want to just divide by 9 and then multiply by pi. You want to divide by the quantity 9 pi. So make sure you put a parenthesis. It would be OK to leave it in this exact form. Or if you're looking for a decimal, please put it appropriately into the calculator. And in this situation, let's also put the units. Units for height would be meters, and everything was the time was in minutes, so meters per minute. So that's the rate at which the height of the water in the container increasing. And it would, it, it would make sense that if the DVDT is positive, the HDT will turn out to be positive. You may also see other kind of problems where water is being drained out of the container. In that case, the volume is decreasing, so your dVdt would have been negative. In that case, notice that the hdt will be negative also because the height in the container will be decreasing. Okay, one last problem of the same type, and then I'm going to wrap up this video, and then in the second segment, we're going to delve into the more complex examples with the word problems. Okay, so in this situation, a similar scenario. Water is rising in a cylindrical container at a rate of 1 over 24 feet per minute. At what rate is the volume changing? And also it is given that the radius in the container, uh, the radius of the cylinder is 12 feet and the height of the cylinder is 20 feet. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of time to try to set this one up and then please come back and check your answers. Okay, so I'm hoping that you pause the video, try to set this up on your own, and now you're coming back. So let's take a look at how you did. So in this situation, water is rising at a rate of 1 over 24 feet per minute. Now that is the height that is changing, right? So the HDT is given to us as 1 over 24. At what rate is the volume of the water in the container changing? So clearly they're asking for DVDT this time. And it's given that the radius of the cylinder is 12 and the height is 20. So R is 12 and H is 20. We may or may not need both of these quantities, but at the moment I'm just writing them down. Okay, so for a cylinder, just like the problem above, we have the equation V equals pi R square H. So V equals pi R square H is what we're beginning with. And once again, for a cylinder, the radius of the water in the container doesn't change as the container is being filled in or emptied out. So the radius is constant for cylinder problems. So we can put that in early on because it doesn't change as time goes by. So put the 12 in there and 12 squared is 144. So you will have V equals pi times 144 times H. So that's your volume equation. Notice uh, the only uh, variable here is h, and the only variable on the left is v. Let's differentiate both sides with respect to the time variable. So dh dt equals 
because this is a constant times h, keep the constant as it is, 144 pi times dh dt. At this point, let's plug in what is given and solve for the unknown. The unknown is dv dt, so you're going to leave it alone on the left-hand side, but we're going to solve for that. Just go ahead and plug in dh dt, which was 1 over 24, so 144 pi times 1 over 24 equals, you could simplify 144 divided by 24 and that gives you 6, so, and the pi you can leave it as it is, so you can say 6 pi, notice the units for volume are going to be cubic feet, and if necessary I can also convert this to a, to a decimal, so if you, you know, plug in pi is 3.14 etc, um, I use the actual pi key on my calculator, so to get a few more decimals I'm getting 18.85 cubic feet per minutes. That's the rate at which the volume of the water in the container changing. Alright, so that's your introduction to related rates and in the next segment we're going to solve a variety of problems. See you next time.